ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the podcast for Without Spot or Blemish Ministry. So glad you're here today. Today we have Chad with us again as part of our ministry. We love to have discussions with him about various subjects and uh, he's going to be along for the ride today. Chad, thanks for being here. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. And so before we begin, as we do always, let's pray. Father God, I just praise you and thank you for this opportunity to come before your people with a truth from your word. And we just praise you and thank you for taking over this podcast. We bind up any and command to leave us any demonic spirits that would try to alter this message in any way, either through me or Chad. In Jesus' mighty name, we bind up that any flesh would speak and we loose that only God through his Holy Spirit would speak about these matters of great importance to your people. In Jesus' mighty name, we also come against and bind up any demonic spirits with the listener right now to cause a message that would try to cause a message to be convoluted in their ears or misinterpreted in any way. We loose that only truth would be given and received today from the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. We loose all these things in the mighty, holy, righteous name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So the title of today's uh, podcast is Guilty Until Proven Innocent, and then uh, when a person does try to state their case, they're often silenced or dismissed. And so we want to talk about that from a biblical perspective. And we want to start with just one simple scripture that occurred in the book of John. And this happened uh, when Jesus was being sought by the Pharisees and Sadducees to kill him and to end his ministry. In the book of John, chapter 7, verse 45, it reads, Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have ye not brought him? The officers answered, Never man spake like this man. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Nicodemus saith unto them, He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, Doth our law judge any man before it hear him, and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And every man went unto his house. Well, there is a scripture that proves that a prophet, indeed the Messiah, a great light comes forth out of Galilee. Um, but they obviously weren't recognizing that scripture. But the main point I want to make about this is he asked them a very pertinent question. Doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? And as they had not heard him and they had prejudged him, based on the witness of others. And this is what we want to talk about today as far as what happens in the world of narcissistic Jezebel abuse. People in positions of being a narcissist or a Jezebel will falsely accuse another and then make sure they're either silenced or that they are uh, dismissed. Whatever they say is dismissed. They'll send out their... Um, flying monkeys, as the world, the secular world calls them, to actually set up a narrative that's completely false. So the false witnesses that came against Jesus are a perfect example of that. This is a tried and true methodology for the Jezebel narcissistic spirit, that is to gaslight and uh, smear campaign, whereas the truth can't be heard. And then the person that's truly the victim is uh, completely uh, silenced or dismissed, as was the case with Jesus. And obviously, as our Savior, he went right to the cross because the lies uh, that were manifested against him. And so now we want to kind of bring this to what we're seeing happen happening in these last days in terms of justice and judgment being flipped on its head and people uh, in our lives that are actually acting as, again, the world calls it the flying monkeys and attacking us and even people in the church that claim to oftentimes even be prophets, and they never did one thing to find out what the what the person they're actually blaming and, and giving false accusation against, they never did one thing to find out the actual story from their, their perspective or their side. What has been your experience uh, with that, just an observation of other people or even in your own life, Mr. Chad? Yeah, um, I've experienced a lot of what you were saying uh, in my particular situation where, you know, whether I feel like it is the case or it actually is uh, could be questionable. But I do feel like a lot of times when I meet people who have already heard the other side, they have a closed mind already. They have a judgment. They never ask my side of the story. Never once do they ask what happened. Never do they ask, did you actually do this? 
So all the assumptions have been heard and made prior to their time with me, wherever they found me, whether it was at a, a church setting or at a grocery store, or restaurant, uh, you name it. Those assumptions are made and anything I say is under the thoughts of what they've already assumed. So the smear campaign took root and they just presumed they didn't even want to talk with you. Or a lot of times I see in the church that they, many people in the church want to hide from subject matters they may find too intimate or embarrassing. And they feel, I've heard enough of this. I don't want to hear the other side too. Right. Because they're just too yeah. embarrassed uh -huh. to approach the truth. Yeah, if you're dealing with a narcissist, the situation can get somewhat bizarre. So the story could be quite crazy. So the subject matter of what they've already heard could be so out there or extreme that they don't even want to think about it or talk about it at all. They just want to, you know, get away from probably even both parties at that point. You know, what's an amazing thing is it, it just as you talk about it and as we brought this up, it just occurs to me, that's just probably part of the devil's scheme that if he can make people that could hear the truth so uncomfortable, they don't want to hear the truth. That's a win too. It doesn't matter how he causes the truth, the, the true narrative, the true story to be shut down, but he can cause uh, the Jezebel narcissist that he indwells to just go off and tell some crazy story that's going to make them so sick and they just don't even want to hear the rest of it. And then they just go on with their lives, but they've already, they bought part of the narrative that could have been sent their way by the Jezebel or the narc. Another thing is, let's say that the narc leaves you or you leave the narc, but either way, the narc feels they, they need to expel some um, crazy story as to why they left you or why things went the way it went. So they take a little bit of truth and throw it way out of proportion, or they just make something out of thin air that's just bizarre and crazy. So the first party to hear the the narcissist side of the fence, they're already at arms, you know, mm. and they're already kind of bugged or wigged out, freaked out, whatever. Um, and so for them to hear anything that's truth that could actually be true, but so also bizarre, you know, so if, if I were to share something that is bizarre, but is true, that too could be misunderstood, devalued, or just something that they want to close their ears and not hear at all. They don't want to believe that people from their church or community could act so egregious. Or maybe maybe they, they can believe it, but the truth at that level acts to bring out uncomfortable things in their own lives too that they're avoiding. So they're avoiding things in their own lives. And then when people tell the truth about what's going on in theirs, it makes them really uncomfortable because they haven't dealt with the things they need to deal with. Because I think a lot of times in the churches where the brick and mortar churches we're talking about, we're talking about some pretty shallow people that don't care too much about anybody but themselves anyway. Um, it's a lot of selfish people that just use God to try to, you know, have some kind of position in the community or to gain favor in business transactions or whatever, and whatever their reasoning is for serving the false God they may be serving in that brick and mortar church that's just doing anything they want that's not lining up with scripture, it stands to reason they're not going to want to go very deep with someone else that's actually addressing the really deep things going on within their family or their or their school or their team or or wherever there's or their workplace or wherever there's um narcissist Jezebel bully type abuse going on. So but it is interesting that you know just talking about this it I feel like like a, a tactic of the enemy has, for me, has just been enlightened, I guess you'd say, in the sense that how many levels and layers of disruption of the truth they will do and how egregious of story they'll tell about the actual victim through the narcissist Jezebel and these crazy stories that do cause other people to bristle and turn away or to, you know, kind of turtle up and not want to talk about it. And then all of a sudden there's no way for the actual victim to communicate their, their true story, uh, without being just dismissed and shunned altogether. Right. A thought just came to my mind also that 
if the victim is pleading for help or assistance from the church, pastoral support or you know leadership or or the community in some way, they're they're asking for help, but they're not receiving it. They're being right. shot, ignored, discredited seen as the aggressor when you're actually the victim. They've already heard the other side. They've already made their judgment. And anything you say is just twisted in their mind. You say one thing and it just comes in their mind as something different. Right. And it could be also, uh, like you said, these people may not be true believers or the, the demonic influences in their own lives are twisting their thoughts to think they heard you say one thing when you didn't. That's true. That's true. That's one reason at the beginning of every... Uh, message that we pray that prayer that the that demons would not convolute the the podcast or the message in the ears of the listener because that does happen a lot in the sense that one person speaking truth will say something and the truth you, there's no other way to define it but truth but the truth will come to the ear of that listener that's demonized and those words will be jumbled up and meant to mean something different as they go into the ears of that person and you're right. I mean, all these narratives and truths can be twisted in um, any way. And that's even probably if, why Jesus felt he needed to say nothing to Pontius Pilate, you know, because anything he said would just be self-incriminating. You know, he tells the truth, but no one wants to hear the truth. Or when they hear it, their demonic influences twist it and confuse them to hear something different. Yeah, or they're just going to twist it on purpose anyway. And, right. you know, what he knew what they were trying to do and they were going to accomplish their mission. He obviously knew the end from the beginning, but there's sometimes where it's the same for us. We just need to just quiet down if the, if the spirit leads us, because you just never know if if the person's motive is an end result. That is to take that take Jesus to the cross. They're going to they're, they're going to do this no matter what Jesus had said. So he knew it was pointless to even speak up in that case, you know. And there's other times where we do need to speak up and defend ourselves. And, you know, it's up to us to have a walk with with God and to be able to hear from the Holy Spirit so well that we know when to speak and when not to speak. And uh, that's an important aspect of this. But I think back to testimonies that I've heard where so-called leaders in the church heard a story from one party and they literally— went on a raging attack on the actual victim and told that person that uh, they've done an egregious sin, that God's spirit's not with them, that they're, they've done really quite wrong. And they never, ever gave that person the chance, A, to state his own story, defend to defend his story or explain why he did what he did. And what he did was actually the right thing. And, uh, it's just amazing for me how many, quote, leaders in the brick and mortar church are literally Satanists that attack the victim, the, the innocent victim. They, they attack the innocent while protecting the guilty. Yeah, so I actually have a firsthand experience of uh, someone in pastoral position. He made it very clear his um, attitude towards me was justified in his mind because he felt that since I filed the divorce, I was a bad person. What he doesn't know is that I had to file the divorce because I had not seen my children in 60 days. And if I didn't take some type of action, there was a chance I'd never see my children. I was already told that I'm not going to see my children. Another pastor was advising for me not to see my children. Because and, of a smear campaign. Yeah, and, and that other pastor had only heard the other side of the story. So, you know, the balls were already in motion, many different ones. And uh, uh, none of these pastors came to hear my side of the story. They didn't want to hear. They only heard one side and they accused me of being the aggressor. So during that time, you had reached out to your church community to ask them to speak to you and to intervene on, on behalf of your family. Did you not? Multiple times before and after filing the divorce paperwork, multiple times before and during and after, long after filing the divorce paperwork, I pleaded for her to come back to me and reconcile, and she ignored every request. But you also pleaded to the church pastors to actually intervene. I pleaded with them to intervene, to get involved, 
to get um, pastors, elders, um, deacons. I was a deacon to get a group of us and get to the bottom of the situation. And it all fell on deaf ears. I was ignored. No response at all. That is amazing. That is such an egregious sin. And yet they heard everything that she had to say. And you know she was probably in there with crocodile tears. And they just thought how wicked you were. But at the very least, I mean, just being supposed men of God, they had, just like Nicodemus said, doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth. And, you know, I have to say that even in my own ministry, I mean, there are times where I sense people are telling me stories. It's usually when they're vague in their accusations. They say, oh, he's a, he or she's terrible. They're a bad person. And they're never specific. They don't give specifics. And so then I can kind of tell, okay, something's not right here. But there are other times where I probably get a pretty good story and I'm really 100% believing the person I'm ministering to. And I'm not saying that they're there's any reason with many people not to, but there's no way that 100% of the people that I've called in this ministry have um, told it from their perspective where it was 100% truth and not just in favor of themselves. There's a proverb in uh, Proverbs 18, verse 17. It says, he that is first in his own cause seemeth just. So the person presenting his cause seems just. They're going right. to tell you the part of the story that makes them look the best and the other person look the worst. Not everybody does this, but um, humble people will actually try to see it from both sides, admit their own failures, that sort of thing. But a narc will never do that. And the rest of this proverb says, but his neighbor cometh and searcheth him. And sometimes, you know, when people call call the ministry and, and I'm praying with them, I'm looking back in retrospect and thinking about how many times I've heard only one side of the story and was an encouragement to the one side and didn't really get to hear the other side because the other side may not still be an equation or they wouldn't want to present the other person uh, in that case. I, I just think it's important to, in a ministerial position, to have the opportunity to hear the truth from both sides, in particular where it's going to decide things as important as who's going to uh, – raise the kids. And even deeper than that, if one parent is trying to negate or to abscond with the, negate the other person's rights with the kids or to abscond with the kids as happens time and time again. Uh, and, uh, and with parental alienation, that's, that's really what this comes down to is parental alienation. And when that happens and the other spouse is uh, vindictive and not fair minded and only wants to win and uses the law, which is, uh, can turn out favorably for narcs and unfavorably for Christians and uses the law to win. Uh, it's just, it's really guilty before proven innocent. And so many people, men and women, will use the kids, and it could be a man who wins in that case, and the man hoards the kids brainwashes, confuses the kids, causes parent alienation, turns the kids, this man turns the kids against the wife, and the kids hate the wife. I do hear these stories, but more frequently I'm hearing it mostly happening to men. Because the man in general these days is just assumed guilty before proven innocent. It seems to me more so than women. Men are seen more as creepy and possible rapists and just the whole Me Too movement, while it's important that the truth come out about those things, the presumption of guilt in men before they've done anything wrong and there's no reason to even think of them that way is just based on stories of people that have lied or just based on the way the media has portrayed men. Like Law & Order uh, SVU is a perfect show. I don't really watch it, but if you do watch it, it's always going to be some creepy guy that's molesting a little girl or a little boy or, or whatever. It's, it's, uh, they've, they've managed to instill fear into people to not trust anyone. But one thing I've noticed is the people that are hardest and the most judgmental on others are the ones with the big beam in their eye that actually they're, they're oftentimes accusing the innocent of what they themselves would, would do or have done. You know, they're projecting their own behaviors onto others. You know, one thing, and I don't mean to like rub salt in a wound or anything, but 
I notice that a, a lot, a lot of times with women accusers, they will have had mul- one or multiple abortions and they will project onto other people, men in this case, that they're going to hurt them or they're going to hurt somebody that they're going to, that the man is the, uh, is the aggressor. But here you have somebody that's actually murdered their own flesh and blood and they are the harshest. I've noticed that they can be the harshest judges in these situations of others. And I think it's because they haven't really acknowledged what they've done. And a lot of times they have to cover up uh, having had an abortion uh, with you know, pharmaceutical drugs and even street drugs because of the guilt and shame that they would feel if they allowed themselves to. But they haven't dealt with it. They haven't sought forgiveness for, from God. They haven't gotten that beam out of their eye. And they're demonized because of what they did, and they just go on the attack. And everybody else is a threat, especially the innocent, when really they themselves have killed the most innocent blood of all. And that is the unborn child that has not done one thing yet, you know, to deserve anything like that. I can't say that I'm an expert or the quantity of people I've asked this question to is uh a good stat, but my personal experience is when I hear uh, a man give his testimony that his wife was physically abusive to him, he'll either reveal it or I'll ask, and he'll reveal that she did commit an abortion. Mm. There's There's a causal link, is there not? I mean, it's all anecdote for me, too. I don't have any studies, nothing like that. It's just anecdotal, and I've seen it, you know, in the ministry, um, and in my own experience and your experience and everyone else I, I've talked to that's had this experience is that the most brutal women are, and probably the most brutal men too, are, are the violent men and the men that have influenced their women to have abortions. They're just as guilty. And I know that a great percentage of abortions have occurred because the man was like, well, I don't want to have this child. I'm not ready or for the it. Father imposed yeah. it on the daughter even. Right, right. So please, women aren't 100 percent responsible for every abortion, although they're part of every abortion. There's still the influence of the men in their lives or, or the men that that leave their leave their the girl alone to have to fend for herself. And and then she doesn't see any way out. She's been deceived by Satan uh, and by society. And then she goes through with it and she was abandoned by the guy that got her pregnant. So, yeah, there's all kinds of men. But adoption. Why yeah, not of adopt? course. Of course, I totally agree. Adoption should have been it. Absolutely. She never should have murdered the baby. But I'm just saying that in that sense, the, the man bears some culpability because he abandoned her once she told him he was preg- she was pregnant. And right. that's wrong. But it did influence the fact that there was an abortion that happened. So I'm, I want to definitely not throw women under the bus entirely for abortion here. I'm not trying to do that. I'm just trying to draw a causality between Women that have abortion and have had abortions, often a lot of women that have had one have had two or even three. Some have had four, five even. Uh, But I'm drawing a connection between the most brutal women among us are often those that if they turned off their conscience enough to do that and to live with themselves after and not think they've done anything wrong, if they'll kill their own flesh and blood, their own child, how much more will they do to other people? And especially if they have a penchant for hating men, you know, through because of feminism already. Not to say they couldn't truly repent, genuinely repent, turn from their wicked ways. And from that day forward, um, have true fear of God and live a life of, of love and respect and kindness, harmless non-threatening, non-physical, non-killing life for the rest of their life, you know? No right. more questions, you know, they, they see the air of their way and they stop, right? Right. Um, I don't know. I'm not an expert on that right now. Well, but I, I mean, I, absolutely. I mean, I think any sin, God forgave David for killing Uriah, but God forgave Saul who became Paul for um, seeing to it that Christians were going to be killed or had been killed. So he stood by while uh, Stephen was killed and um, held the clothes of the men that killed him. So uh, God forgave that. God can forgive even murder. 
and even the murder of somebody's own offspring, absolutely, and what be washed clean. But my contention is someone that's actually been forgiven like that, really forgiven, they become like the woman who cried tears over the feet of Jesus and washed his feet with her hair. And that's someone that's humbled themselves to an amazing point and isn't going to sit there and throw rocks at anyone else because they know that they themselves have done something uh, worthy of death and God forgave them. And that type of woman who hears a conversation we're having concerning abortion would not strike out in anger at us to even mention it. Right. You know, they would not be on the offense or defense mode. They would recognize it and agree and 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 be at very soft caution and, and add to the discussion as well. So um, they would live probably the rest of their life in humility and not aggression. Right. But but the opposite the opposite occurs when they have not gone before the feet of Jesus and repented and I mean truly repented and, and received his forgiveness. And not just because they want to look better in the eyes of society or man or, or the potential spouse they might have, because I've seen people re, you know, say they repent to get a spouse or a man to, to marry. I've seen that in, several times in ministry where men have told me that the women that they were seeing said they'd had abortion, but they were so repentant you know, prior to marriage. But it was almost in retrospect, they see it as a repentance that was just to get what they wanted instead of like truly being sorry for what they did. But to your point, Chad, I think if someone for any sin, again, any sin is truly sorry for what they've done, what's going to come out on the other side is a willingness to help others and to forgive others because they've been forgiven much and to love others and to also extend grace to others because grace has been extended to them. And the result is not going to be running off with the child of the other person, you know, right? Uh, as the case with so many people that we talk to. And it's amazing how many uh, men that we know of uh, in the state of Texas, like I've seen videos of this guy who uh, was was married to a woman who was and he's under 10 years old. And she's saying that he knows already that he's a transvestite and she's trying to make him into essentially a, a tranny. It's a very, very sad situation. It sounds like the boy is very torn between what is right and what is wrong. I'm assuming when he's around the mother, he is in fear to uh, capitulate and say, yeah, I'm a girl, and have the teachers call him a girl. He dresses up like a girl going to school. He uh, probably is having uh, the students have to call him a girl and treat him like a girl and go to the girl's restroom. Um, this is sick, twisted, perverted, um, child abuse. I, I don't even know where to start with all this. I mean, it's just sickening. And she's fighting in court to make sure that this um, lifestyle is being maintained. And she's fighting against the father because when the boy's with the father, he actually wants to be a boy. That's what he, he tells the father. Right. Naturally. And He's so little with the father and so much with the mother, it would seem to me that why why would he tell the father that? I mean, he's he if he really wants to be a girl, he's obviously in the right place. He's not um, in the sense that he's with his mom all the time. His father's not abusing him for it. You know, he's just asking him, what do you, what, you know, and how can a kid under 10 know any of this stuff? But he's at least, the, the father's not mistreating him for it. He's not suffering any like negative results from the father. The father. The father just wants to protect his son and to allow him to live the life of a, of a boy instead of a girl. Well, the father um, reads and believes the Bible is what he tells me. And so um, his justification and reasoning um, would be the same as mine. So I appeal to his side of the fence in this situation. Of course, we both do. But I guess what I'm saying is the boy... There is no threat of harm to him uh, with the father that the father is going to hurt him if he says, I want to be a girl to his father. You see what I'm saying? There's no, there's no result with the father other than I guess the father could express disappointment, obviously, but he stands to suffer more from the mother's side of the equation if he doesn't agree to being a transvestite little boy with the mother is what I'm saying. 
because right. he's with the mother the predominance of the time. So I guess my point I'm trying to make is he has no reason to tell the father he wants to be a boy if it's not true. Exactly. See, see what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. So if he's going back to the mother and saying, yeah, I want to be a girl, and he's doing all the stuff, it sounds like he's trying to please uh, a mother that's pressuring him into doing this thing. Now, I'm talking about it right now like being a transvestite isn't a perversion of God's word. He says that men— should not dress as women or vice versa. It's an abomination to God. Obviously, um, the, the Bible says that if a man lie with a man, it's an abomination. Same with women with women. I mean, the Bible makes it expressly clear this is an abomination and a sin. But it just seems to me that the pressure and the twisting comes from Satan's camp through a mother like this to twist up that son and and to really as a way of hurting the father even more. It's a way of using the child as a weapon. It's a parental alienation tactic because right. the mother knows that the father has has uh, a Christian underpinnings to his life. Uh, it's become quite public, and people are donating to help him pay for his lawyers. He has a tremendous amount of money funding her, her team of lawyers, probably from the right. homosexual society or agendas you know that they want to see this they want to see her win right so getting back to the main theme of what we're talking about how in his case or in other cases you're aware of have you seen men presumed guilty uh before innocence he is completely being um discredited and demolished in the courtroom he's being so ignored I think the, I th as a nobody and nothing. I think the way that they've they've done that to him is like you said through the discreditation and the um the dis they're silencing him and dismissing him obviously in court. Mm -hmm. But I think that by they've painted him in a bad light like like they're painting him and him as evil because he doesn't want his child to be a gender that he wasn't born with. And he wants what God did to be held up, and he has every right to want that, but he's painted as guilty as charged because he doesn't want the satanic outcome they do. It's a false well, accusation against him. What's interesting, too, in that, that case is um, probably 15 years ago, psychologists would say that um, uh, those struggling with um, their sexuality or the, or what their uh, sex is is a mental disorder, right? But this father is being accused now by this by the psychologist of being uh, psychologically disturbed or screwed up in the head. The father is because he cannot recognize the fact that his son is actually a girl, and and it's just it's just it's society. so on its head. They're the ones yeah. that are psychologically. Uh, yeah, yeah. Challenged. So you have people with degrees who are supposedly the only authority that the courts want to listen to. Right. And these people with degrees are saying the most moronic, dark thing you can imagine. Exactly. That the father sees his boy, knows he's a boy, his everything about this child is boy. From the body parts to uh, all the science that we can take blood tests from, he's absolute boy. Even if they change his body parts, he's still boy. They can't fix it. They can't change him. He will always be a boy. And the psychologists have quite a nerve to try to commit this man as psychologically unbalanced or messed up in the head because he sees his son as a boy. He sees truth and reality, and so they are turning everything on its head. Yeah, and they're right. using it so, in the court against him. So now he's the bad guy. He's the pervert. Yeah. He's got the perverted mentality instead of them being the perverts that want to see little boys and, and uh, with little boys and dressing as girls, and pedophilia will be next. You watch. Bestiality and pedophilia is next after all they've done. And it's all the things that's in, in Leviticus, and I think it's chapter 19, it's either 18 or 19, where all these um, perverted sexual acts are forbidden. They, they're going to do every single one of them. Homosexuality, bestiality, pedophilia, that's their thing. 
Satanists derive uh, power from that. They get power from their demons the deeper they go into that dark sin. The power is not infinite and it is not um, and it is temporary and it's not going to last very long. So, but hell will be forever, and I sure hope all these people repent for their for their soul's sake. Well, Chad, I sure appreciate you coming on today's podcast. Is there anything else you'd like to conclude with? Any thoughts on your heart about guilty before innocent? Yeah, um, I, I think it's just important to have this video um, because people, either they know it or they don't at the beginning of a situation like this, when they're talking to people, they're already seen as guilty. So if you're watching this video and something has occurred in your life just recently, take note of this video. You know, just listen to it. Just think about it. Pray about it. Um, understand that when you meet people who have possibly already heard the other side, they may already be closed-minded to hear your side. They may be a flying monkey and act like they're interested or listening or ready to gossip or twist your words. Just be aware of these things, you know? And let God defend you. Don't always have to defend yourself. You know, the truth is going to come out. Jesus said what they've done in the darkness will come out into the light and should be shouted from the rooftops. So, Sometimes we just got to lay back and, and just let the truth, let God reveal the truth. And there are people that uh, are in the world that they're so deceived, they live to be deceived. They don't want to know the truth anyway. And, you know, it's like Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine. There's no sense in trying to persuade every individual to your side of it, you know, and just put, just give out all that energy. It's wasted toward them. So, you know, let God move on you who you should talk to and who you shouldn't. I'm not to say to clam up with everybody and not reveal your story when God leads you to, but I would just say to be cognizant of the fact that there are people out there that are, like Chad said, flying monkeys or they're part of the smear campaign. They're, they're enablers and Ahabs to the Jezebel narcissist that's going to um, tell this false narrative about you. And just just really calm down calm down and relax in this in the Lord calm down and know that you're under if you're in the truth you're with God and if God before you can be against you but if you're with lies you're with the, the father of lies and that's the devil and so just recognize when you're talking to somebody that's been demonized and and, and lives in a world of deceit that there's no point in trying to go on and on persuading them but God will definitely, over time, he'll be your ally. Some of us are being, this is happening to some of us, so we'll learn to make God our all in all and to trust him and him alone. And then as you begin to do that, God will bring other people into your life. And he puts us into families with other people that uh, are part of his family, part of the kingdom of heaven. And he will equally yoke us with different people. But for the time being, if you're alone and this sort of thing has happened to you and you've been isolated, Use the time to get as close to God as possible. Make him your all in all. And then after that, watch as he brings more people into your life to uh, strengthen. You know, one can send a thousand to flight to 10,000. So uh, having community and being part of and fellowshipping is, is it's so important. It's so important with the proper people. But sometimes we got to step away and be alone for a little bit so we can just recognize between who's evil and who's good get into the world word ourselves so we can discern right from wrong. Let God use that time to build you up and then he'll put you in the body where you need to be so that you can help other people and, uh, and be helped by other people as well. So, okay, Chad, this would be a good time to conclude. So father God, I just praise you and thank you for this opportunity to come together. I thank you for opening our eyes to these truths and helping us to see uh, the way the enemy works, his strategies, his tactics, the way he executes his plans. And I just thank you for, causing us to see those things and to hide up under the shadow of your wing while also using the weapons of our warfare and doing spiritual warfare, to do spiritual warfare against the demonic entities that are attacking us, so that we should remember that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world. I praise you and thank you for these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I want to thank everybody for uh, partaking in today's podcast. If you like the music you're hearing, you can uh, download it free of charge at the Reverb Nation link below. You can also see our, our blog spot at withoutspotorblemish.blogspot.com. That's the link below. 
If you'd like to make a donation, uh, you can do so. Everything we do is free, even down to ministry calls and prayers and email prayers and the like. All of that's free. We do nothing that costs a penny. But if you'd like to donate, you can do so at the PayPal link below. And we will see you next time on the podcast for Without Spot or Blemish Ministry.